Okay, recording has started. Good morning and welcome everybody back to the second lecture R for BC 106, Interpreting Scripture. So in the previous hour, we just, you know, kind of went through very quickly on uh, something very important, which is the process of meditation. Uh, and uh, I just want to repeat uh, what I said. Uh, meditation is a discipline we have in our lives for the, for the rest of our lives. We have to learn how to meditate in the word because God has given that to us as a way to put his word into our hearts. Right? So the word must be uh, sown into our hearts in order for it to produce. And so it should get into our hearts through the process of meditation. Now, there's a question in the chat from Silitoli. Um, she says, really like the method you mentioned in the lecture regarding how we meditate on specific scriptures on a particular day. And I want to apply personally in my meditation time. So I just wanted to know how much scripture portion would be ideal per day. So what I would suggest, Silitoli, you know, you could, I mean, if you want to do it like how I, how we talked about, or let me just share that document there. Oh, maybe, yeah. So uh, we, I, I give you three different practices that I use uh, to meditate in the word. Uh, one is word seeds. That means I just meditate on a certain theme or topic, which is something I keep doing. Um, second is, uh, I, I used to have a fixed timetable, like, you know, uh, every particular day of the week meditate on certain topics. Um, I found that very helpful, you know, in the early years, uh, because it kind of uh, gave me a little bit of discipline that on this day, I must uh, do this, you know, so it was very helpful in the early years. Uh, and uh, if you if you want to follow that kind of a timetable, that's a good idea. And w w what I would say is, uh, uh, towards the end of that book, God's Word the Miracle Seed, towards the end of that book, um, I have listed all the topics from A to Z. Uh, and under each topic, I've listed what scriptures. Now, for example, for A, authority, answer to prayer, anointing, uh, B, for boldness, for uh, bones in our body, boneless bones, for blessing, C, for children, for courage, for confidence, D, for deliverance, for day, E, for eternal life or exploits, and things like that, you know. So you can go A to Z, all different topics and scriptures on those topics. So what you do is you form a little timetable. Uh, you decide that, okay, every Sunday I will meditate on one topic or two topics. And then you can take from that section towards the end of the book, from that topic, take about five or six scriptures and meditate on that. Yeah. So for example, when I say anointing, I would usually start off, you know, with Luke chapter four, 17 and 18. And I would meditate in Acts 10, 38. Uh, I would meditate and talk about the anointing of God. I would, uh, I would also look into some Old Testament scriptures, you know, Exodus 35 what the anointing of God does in our lives, Isaiah 10, 27. Um, scriptures related to the work of the Holy Spirit, you know, John 7, 37 to 39. So what happens when you meditate is the word of God becomes part of you. you know? And so I would say take five or six scriptures on those topics and you do it like a discipline. you know. Uh, and uh, so you can start out like that with a timetable that will help you develop that discipline. Uh, did I answer your question? Um, yes, Pastor, that was very helpful. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Right. And then later on, you know, you could uh, do other things. Uh, uh, later on in this course, when we talk about tools to study the word, uh, I will explain a little further on contemplative Bible reading, you know, so the tools you could use to meditate and study the word. So let's go forward now. We'll go back to what we were talking about. 
Um, yeah. So we're continuing now with the parable of the sower. What we are learning through this parable is how can we get the seed of the word to produce in our life? That's the essence of the parable, right? That's the reason Jesus gave us the parable, to awaken us, to understand that the word of God is like seed, but there's a process involved for that seed to produce in our lives. And we must, you know, the, we must make sure, you know, we must take care of the process. So first part of the process, the seed must be sown into our heart. The seed, if it just remains in the Bible, it is it will not produce. It's there in the Bible, but it needs to go from the Bible. It needs to get into our heart and through the process of meditation. But then, once the seed is sown in our heart, there's some other things involved. That's what we want to uh, understand from the same parable. We must protect and nurture the seed. It is very interesting that Satan is after the word. You know, and you find this in Matthew, Mark and Luke. Satan, the wicked one comes to snatch the word. So what is Satan after? He's after the word. Satan comes immediately to take away the word, Mark says. And Luke says, the devil comes, takes away the word. So what is Satan after? He's after the word. He doesn't want the word to take root in our hearts. Why? Because this is God's way of working in our lives. When the word takes root, it's going to produce. So Satan is after the word of God. He does not want the word to get into our hearts. He wants to take it away. Now, what enables Satan to take the word away from us or anyone who hears the word? Right? So now, see, we understand the, when, the, when the word of God is in us, we become overcomers. Now John wrote, I have written to you young men because you are strong. The word of God abides in you and you have overcome. You have overcome the wicked one. See, the word, when it gets into us, it will make us overcomers, overcome the wicked one. So that's the thing. The devil does not want the word to get into us because if it does, we will become overcomers. So as long as the word is, you know, it's in the Bible, it's in some sermon, somebody's talking, this, that. Uh, okay, he's not worried. But the moment the word is getting into our hearts, he wants to try to take it away. Right? Now, of course, he can try to distract us, you know, through uh, being disinterested. We are busy. Uh, sometimes we don't understand the word. Uh, sometimes doubts and unbelief. So Satan is going to try all these tactics to try to keep the word away from us. Yet, you know, he doesn't want the word to be sown in our hearts. He'll try all these things. And what we are seeing in this parable is we must understand the word, right? So the, the, the word, you know, uh, the word must be protected and nurtured. And as Satan will, you know, there are other things, persecutions, cares of this world. We will look at this later. But the, the, the word, uh, where did I say this? Sorry, I just, uh, uh, yeah. So the thing that keeps us from receiving the word is when we do not understand it. And I explain it in the next chapter. When we do not understand it, then Satan comes and steals the word. So, this lack of understanding 
gives Satan the opportunity to take the word away. Okay. So we can hear the word. So you can be sitting under the best preacher who's preaching. But if you don't understand it, what happens? Satan just takes away the word. It doesn't get sown in our hearts. So this understanding the word is so important. Hearing the word is not enough. We have to understand it. Now, there are other important things we have to do. Like I was saying, you know, our persecutions and cares, we will, we will look at that later. But when the seed is sown, it will produce in our lives. Just that the kingdom of God is like a man putting a seed in the ground, time passes by, it will germinate, it will produce. It will produce. But the thing that keeps that word from producing, uh, is Satan can take it away if we don't understand it. Right? And so that's the next part. We, when we do not understand the word, the, then the wicked one comes. He does not understand, then the wicked one comes. So if you don't receive spiritual understanding of what the word means, the devil can snatch away the word. Take it off. It's like in the parable, Jesus said the birds come and pick up the seed and take it off. So that's what the devil does. Takes the word away from our hearts. Okay? So we need to get to grasp, to comprehend, to understand uh, the word. So not only intelligently and intellectually, but spiritual understanding of this, understanding of spiritual truth, it's revelation. Right? So we need to get that understanding of the word. Spiritual. So uh, this is where, you know, the scriptures and we discuss the fact that the human intellect may not always understand the things of God. Yeah. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit. They're full in foolishness to him. And he can't know them. He can't understand them. Why? Because they are spiritually understood. They are spiritually understood. That means we need the enabling of the Holy Spirit to receive revelation, receive what the Word of God means and or what is the meaning of the Word. Right? But God has given us His Holy Spirit. Yeah, and, and he reveals through his spirit the things of God. So he says, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit of who's from God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us by God. So God has given the spirit of God that we might know, that we might understand. So this is where we pray, Holy Spirit, give me revelation. I want to understand the word, right? So before you, you, know, you read the word, oh God, help me understand. Oh God, open my eyes. I need, because if I don't understand the word, it will not produce because the devil is going to take it off. He won't let the word get into my heart. So if I don't get spiritual understanding of the word, it won't even fall into my heart. It won't get, it won't get implanted into my heart. It's gone. Satan will take away the word. Because he knows if the word gets into my heart, it will produce. So this is my prayer. Holy Spirit, you are there. You help me know the things that are freely given to me by God. You help me open my eyes to see. Right? And God will give us. So we pray for revelation. You know, this is a Beautiful prayer to pray for 
all of ourselves. You know, you pray, you say, Lord, give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation in knowing you. May the eyes of my understanding be enlightened that I may know what is the hope of your calling. That means what's the purpose of your calling? That I may know what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance. This that I may know the inheritance. You know, so there are four things Paul is praying here. Know him, know the hope of your calling, that means the purpose of your calling. Know the riches of your inheritance and know the greatness of his power. Four things. He says, I want you to know four things. I want you to know him. I want you to know the purpose of your calling. I want you to know the inheritance you've given, you've been given. And I want you to know the greatness of God's power towards us. But this comes through the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Holy Spirit, give me wisdom and revelation. Right? So this is where, once again, when we are meditating, the Holy Spirit gives us wisdom and revelation. And we call it illumination. Right? He gives that to us so we can understand the word. And once you understand the word, the devil has no chance. He can't steal it. He can't take it away. It's going to go, the word is going to go right into your heart. And it's going to start producing. Okay, So we talked about meditation. Then comes revelation. It's important. But the revelation comes to us through the Holy Spirit. Right? As you're meditating, Holy Spirit gives you revelation. You get understand. Oh, I know this is what the word says. I know this is what it means. Now, in revelation, in the process of revelation, that is where hermeneutics comes in. That means that is where we are going to do our part to study the word. Right? To correctly understand the word. That is where hermeneutics come in. Holy Spirit is giving us wisdom and understanding, and we are doing our part. We are, we're going to learn how to study the word. We use tools today. We have the tools today. I've shared with you the tools you can use to study the word. Uh, we have the rules by which we interpret the word. So we are doing our part. Holy Spirit is doing his part. And then we get a correct understanding, a good understanding of the word of God. The devil cannot steal the word. It's going to produce. It's going to go into our hearts and it's going to produce in our lives. But remember this, Satan is after the word. And the only thing that gives him opportunity to take that word away is when we don't understand it. If you don't understand it, gone. He takes it off. It can't produce. So we can keep hearing the word, hearing the word, hearing the word. If you're not understanding, Satan easily takes it off. Right? But that's where what we're going to learn in this course is very important. How to correctly understand the word that the word will produce in our lives. Now, there are other harvest blockers Jesus talked about in the parable of the sower. He said, when you hear the word, and he receives the word. So this man, he receives the word. He welcomes it. But there's no root. There's no root. Why there is no root? Jesus said, tribulation or persecution comes because of the word. It, it, it is interesting. He says, in all these places, Tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake. Right? In a time of temptation and a time of testing, that word temptation is the, the, the word, the Greek word can be translated testing or it can be translated temptation. Just so depending on the context, they would you know, use the word test or temptation, you know, but it's the same Greek word in, in most places. Um, so, because of the word, 
See, so you receive the word with joy. You're all, you know, the man is so excited. Wow, I love it. They, they, they hear the word of God. They receive it with gladness. They receive it with joy. I mean, so happy. This is what the word says. So just because somebody receives, there is an initial reaction to the word. Yes, amen. Wonderful. This is, doesn't mean it's going to produce. Why? Because after that, challenges come. Difficulties come because of the word. That means it's aligned to the word. So, example, when you hear the when you're hearing teaching on divine healing, that God is the healer and God, he, then right after that, ah, oh, you'll face some difficulties, you know, health situation. So tribulation arises for the word's sake. Or you hear the word of God, you know, concerning, you know, God has not given us a spirit of fear. God has made us bold right after that some situation will try to come and make us fearful it's the tribulation of persecution or testing or challenges come in line with that word and that's the real test you've received the word with joy but you're facing difficulty in line with that word that is challenging that word Will you hold on to it or give up on it? So, what did Jesus say? They endure only for a while. That means they're all excited about the word, but it's for a short moment. They endure only for a time. Eh? They're excited about the word, but it's very short-lived. And during the time of difficulty, they fall away. They give up on the word. Okay, okay, okay. I have healing. I don't want healing. Healing is okay. It's okay. Not for me. For somebody else. They give up on it. Oh, it's so being bold. They give up. Oh, fear, fear, fear comes. In. So they're excited about the word. They receive the word with gladness, but it is very short-lived. The moment they are challenged in that word, some difficulty, tribulation, persecution, temptation, Something challenges that word, they give up. So Jesus said, these people are like the seed that falls on the stones, on the rocks. There is no root. There's no root. No root. And if you don't have root, you cannot produce. They have no root. Right? They have no root. You see this in all... Uh, all the three places have no root. That means the word didn't get deep into their heart. They received it, but it's not taking root because they give up when they face difficulties. So here's another part of the process. If the word is going to produce in our lives, we must hold on to the word of God. Not just when you hear it and you get excited, but hold on to the word even through the difficulties. Through the, you know, whatever the challenging situation may be. Example, you know, somebody hears the word of God. You know, my God shall supply all your need. God will provide. God is the God who cares for his people. He's the shepherd. He will not let us be in want. Oh, they're all so excited. My God's going to take care of my needs, everything. The next thing they may face a little Financial challenges, oh, they give up on. Maybe God won't take care of me. They, no root. They endure only. They give up on the word. So what happens? The word does not produce. Nothing wrong with the seed. The seed was designed to produce, but because we gave up, the seed will not produce. So the message for us is, even when we face opposition, the challenging situations, hold on to the word. Right? So stand through the opposition to, right? and let the word take deep root. Another thing is the choke thorns that choke the word. So what Jesus said is, there was another set of, set of uh, people who they received the word. So here again, they received the word. Right? But then, 
there were things that were around it that choked the word. It's like th like the thorns. So, the seed is good. It gets into the heart. It's starting to, you know, get implanted and starting to germinate. It is beginning to spring up. But what happens? Things choke the word. And what are those things he mentioned? He said things like the cares of this world, meaning all the responsibilities, the deceitfulness of riches, that means the pull of wealth and money. So cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, the desire for other things, and they get attracted to other things. Or uh, Luke puts it, pleasures of life. So what happens? We receive the word, it gets into our heart, but then we let other things come in. The cares, the responsibilities, We're going after the, you know, the riches. Now there's nothing wrong if God has blessed somebody and they have a lot of money, good for them, God bless them. We're not against it. Uh, but to go running after money, to go running after riches, if that giving into the pull, what happens? It can choke the word. Desire for other things. So it could be anything else in the world that is coming into our heart and occupying space in our heart. Pleasures of life. Now God, does, obviously God has created so many nice things. You know, there is some people like nature, they like the mountains, the forests, uh, the beaches, whatever, you know, God has given us wonderful things. Nothing wrong to enjoy. But if we get caught up in the pleasures, things of life, so cares, responsibilities, being deceived by riches, desiring other things, pleasures of life, if these things start coming into our heart, occupying space in our heart, it will choke the word. And the word becomes, in our heart, unfruitful. So we are not able to see anything happen in that person's life. So they're hearing the word. It's getting in, but it's not producing. Why? Because there are other things inside that are choking the word. Things like what? Cares of the world, deceitful riches, desire for other things, pleasures of life. They choke the word. So nothing wrong with the word. But there's a problem in the environment, in the heart. There are things that are choking the word. So we have to guard our heart. Don't let these things come. Now, all of us face the cares of this world. We all face it. We all have the responsibilities. Uh, we have to fulfill our responsibilities. Some of it can be very heavy. We all have that. We all have to face it. We all face deceitfulness of riches because money is part of our life. We have to, you know, we need money. We have to use money. We have to pay this and pay that and all those things. Yeah, it's there. Other things, there are things in this world that may seem pleasurable, attractive. We all face it. But we must protect our heart, keep these things away, so that the Word of God can get implanted and bear fruit. Okay? And finally, so guard against these things, okay? Protect your heart and affirm your love for God, guard your own heart. Lastly, finally, there are three keys we see in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew says we have to understand. Mark says we have to receive. And Luke says we have to retain if the word is to produce in our lives. So I have clubbed these three together. We have to understand the word, which is with the help of the Holy Spirit. 
We have to receive the word. That means, yes, God, I embrace it. I welcome it in my life. I've got to retain it. That means it's not just a short-lived thing. I stay with the word. Then what happens? It will bring fruit in our lives. It will bring fruit in our lives. Things will begin to happen. The word will produce. God said, my word that goes forth will not return to me void. It will produce. But we have to follow the process. God, our heart, understand, receive, and retain the scriptures. Receive, retain. Right? And we keep living by the word. And we will be blessed. All right? So this is the key. You are God's garden. You sow the seeds of the word and you will receive. So word seeds, I'll just close with this. You know, so uh, in the same book, in this chapter, for various topics, I've given you references. You know, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, in an order from Old Testament to New Testament. Of course, you can pick any of these verses you want uh, uh, on, on, on these topics. Answer to prayer an armor of God, baby in the womb, and believer's authority, blessing, blood of Jesus, boldness, bones. So what you do is you meditate in the scriptures. So these are like seeds. You've got to sow the seed if you want to harvest. So you can, you know, depending on the harvest, which area you want to see the harvest, uh, you meditate in the seeds of the word. And you'll begin to see, if you follow the process, you will begin to see the word of God producing in our lives. All right. Any questions so far? Everybody is with me. You've understood what we have uh, uh, covered so far in the book, and I've gone through it quickly. Any questions before we go to the next chapter? All right. Okay. So I trust all of you have uh, you know understood the parable of the sower. It's a very basic but very important parable. It it gives us the mystery, the secrets of how to have the word of God produce in our lives. I want to encourage all of us to practice it, make it a part of our uh, studying in the word of God. Okay. So now we're going to move forward into the next chapter where we start getting into the uh, the course itself, the course content. Uh, uh, all right, so we covered chapter one right now, which is God's word, the miracle seed. We've gone through that book. Now we are getting into chapter two, right? So let's just look at some terminology, yeah, uh, that, that generally we, we, we must be familiar with. So when we talk about hermeneutics, we're talking about how to understand the meaning, the meaning of the text. Right? So how do you go about doing that? So there are rules or there are principles that we follow. We're going to learn them. Very important. And there is a way. Yeah, that is a method of how you study so that you can get the meaning. So that's what this course is going to focus on. What are the rules and the methods by which we determine the meaning of a text? Now, there is, uh, when we talk about exegesis, exegesis is another term. It simply means you are bringing out the meaning of the text in its context. Uh, in its context could be the historical, it could be the literary, it could be so many other things. But basically you're bringing out the meaning of the text. And so you call that exegesis. So uh, when somebody is uh, doing exegesis, it means they're explaining, they're bringing out the meaning in its, the meaning of a text in the place in the context of what it was written, uh, historical, cultural, literary, other things. Exposition is taking exegesis one step forward. 
That means you're bringing out the meaning, but you're also making it relevant to the hearers. That's exposition. Okay. So hermeneutics is what we do when we study. Exegesis is what we do when we explain. Exposition is what we do when we communicate with relevance to our hearers. That means I'm bringing out the meaning, but I'm bringing it with relevance. I'm making it uh, understandable and applicable to the people who are listening. Okay. Now, homiletics or preaching, you will, you, are, you will study it in a different course, which deals with the principles and the methods of how to preach, you know, how to communicate to people. So that's homiletics. Okay. Whereas in our, uh, in our course, we are going to focus mainly on hermeneutics, but this is going to help us in our exegesis and our exposition. That if we do this correctly, if we get the, if we know how to understand the meaning of the text correctly, then we know how to explain the meaning, and we know how to make it relevant to people who are listening to us. Okay, and then of course there is the. Uh, aspect of teaching. So preaching and teaching could be combined uh, in the under homiletics or uh, or you could break it separately. But it's uh, there's a preaching situation, there's a teaching situation, but it's basically communicating the word of God to people, whether you preach it or teach it, it doesn't matter. Okay. All right. So let's get started. So we know that, and we have seen these scriptures before, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So we know that the scripture are inspired by God. God has breathed into the words of the Bible, and he is the author of the scriptures. We also have read 2 Peter 1, 16, 21, that uh, the human authors were guided by the Holy Spirit when they wrote the scripture. So they didn't just make it up, but the Holy Spirit guided them. So while God has given to us the scriptures, we need help to interpret the scriptures. So let's go to Acts chapter 8. Now, I didn't give the full passage here, but uh, I would request us to turn to Acts chapter 8. And I will just uh, tell, request us to read one verse here from Acts 8. In Acts chapter 8, if let me give you the... Uh, exact words. Um, Acts chapter 8. Let's, can somebody read verse 20, or let's read the passage. Uh, Acts 8, 29 to 35. Acts 8, 29 to 35. Can somebody read that for us, please? Verse 29 onwards, then the Spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter and as a lamb before his sharer to its sharer is silent. So he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. The Enoch uh, answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does the prophet say of this? Of himself or someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth and, begin, and beginning from the scripture, he preached Jesus to him. Hmm. As they went along. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, you look at um, verse 13. So here's a very educated man. Uh, this is uh, a man who was the treasurer to the queen of Ethiopia. So high-ranked, high-ranked official. 
he has purchased a copy of the book of Isaiah and he's reading it. And he's covered quite a bit. He's come to the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. And uh, the Holy Spirit has sent Philip to join this chariot. And Philip asks him, you know, uh, 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 do you understand what you are reading? Verse 30. Do you understand what you're reading? So this man, very intelligent man, he's reading the scriptures, but he is not understanding what he's reading. And he says in verse 31, you know, how can I unless somebody guides me? So he's really, he needs help to understand the scriptures. And like that, there are so many people today who need help to understand the scriptures. And uh, Philip, from the passage here in Isaiah 53, is able to explain it to him. And what it says here in verse uh, 35 is, he explains to him that uh, you know Isaiah 53 is actually speaking about Jesus. So Philip has got the revelation. Isaiah 53 is speaking about Jesus. Right? He explains. So this, this is just a simple example where people read the scriptures, but they need help in understanding it, in receiving the revelation of the scriptures. Uh, another example there is in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1 through 8. Maybe uh, we can turn there. Uh, Nehemiah. Here's again another example where People heard the scriptures, but, you know, somebody had to explain it to them. Um, Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1 to 8. Could somebody read that for us, please? Nehemiah chapter 8, 1 through 8. Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square, that was in front of the water gate. And they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear, hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday before the men and women and those who could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. So Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of wood which they had made for the purpose and beside him at his right hand stood Matthitaya. You can skip Shrima. all those names. It's okay. Go on to verse 5 please. Okay. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people for he was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Okay, also verse eight. Joshua. Mm -hmm. um, all right, uh, maybe the uh, uh, last verse. Was... Okay, mm -hmm. And the Levites helped the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they read distinctly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. Hmm. Amen. Amen. So this is a, was a little long passage, but it's very beautiful. In the Old Testament times, okay? So they're opening the Old Testament, and Ezra is reading. The people have very reverence, with very reverential. They're standing up, you know, half a day they're standing. They're listening to the reading of the scriptures. Uh, they are worshiping God when they hear the reading of the scriptures. But it also says there in verse, and it was the latter part of verse 7 and then verse 8. It says, not only did they read from the scriptures, it says they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. You know, so not only did they read, but they gave them, they helped the people understand 
the sense. They interpreted the reading and they helped them to understand it. So that is a part that you and I are learn, going to learn how to do. Right? How do you, how do we not only read the scriptures, but how do we bring out the meaning, the understanding and the revelation of the scriptures? Now, why is this important? Because if we do not interpret the Bible correctly, we will end up applying it wrongly. You know, we can read the scriptures, but if you don't understand it, we can do something wrong. We think we're doing the, what the Bible is saying, but if we didn't understand correctly, we will apply it incorrectly. Now we will explain it to people wrongly and they will go and do something there, you know, that may be hurtful, harmful. So we have to be careful. Right? Now, uh, I'm script, skipping these scriptures here. Now, what are the challenges we face? Let me just cover maybe uh, just a little bit more and then we will stop. What are the challenges we face in interpreting scripture? So we know the Bible was written way back in time. So the Old Testament, you know, almost three and a half thousand years ago, about 3,400 years ago, almost around that time. New Testament, almost 2,000 years ago. So, you know, the times are so different. Here we are, 2,000 years after the New Testament was written, or 3,500 years after the first five books were written. So we are here in a different time frame. And it's also written in different language. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Uh, some of it was written in Aramaic, uh, the language of the Babylonians at that time. And the New Testament was written in Greek. So what are the challenges? There's a spiritual gap that means the people living in those days had a certain spiritual understanding and here we are far away in time, in a different time and place. Our spiritual understanding may be different. We were not brought up in those environments. There's a time gap. Like we said, you know, we are living in different ages. There's a ge geographical gap. Most of the things, the biblical geography is around, in and around the Middle East, more specifically Israel and its neighbors. But we, we are living in different parts of the world. Uh, many of us have never been to Israel. We don't understand the geography and you know the situation. There's a cultural gap. There's a language gap. There's a literary gap. That means uh, even in our understanding of uh, literature, the way, the, the, the phrases, the idioms, the, um, the metaphors, you know, the language itself and the, and the style of writing itself is very different from our, what we are used to. So we're just putting out, okay, look, these are the challenges. When we are going, going to read the scriptures, we should be able to bridge these gaps in order to get the correct meaning of the scriptures. Okay. And that's part of what we're going to learn uh, in, 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 uh, in, uh, in the rules of interpretation. We need to bridge these gaps the best we can. And we have the tools today that will help us do it. So we make use of the tools so that we can be confident that we are interpreting the scriptures correctly. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. Our time is almost out. We'll pick this up from here and then we'll you know, get into uh, various uh, details on how to uh, interpret the scriptures and the tools of, that we can use to study the scriptures, all of that, okay?
So um, I trust everyone is following me so far. Everything is okay. Uh, could uh, somebody close this class in prayer? And you know, please please feel free to ask questions anytime, uh, especially as we get into the the actual rules of interpretation and how to study the word. Please feel free to ask questions. Okay. Let's close in prayer. Could somebody pray and dismiss the class, please? Well, let's pray. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we want to thank you for this time of learning. We submit us as a, a class to your mighty presence, God. Lord, um, as we learn today, God, help us to meditate on your word and help us to draw insights from your spirit, Lord Jesus, in what intention you have spoken those words. Lord, we pray that you would continue to speak to us so that we can understand. And as we continue to learn how to interpret the scriptures that you have provided us, we pray, oh God, let your Holy Spirit lead us and help us to learn this in the perfect way, Lord Jesus, and also to apply in our lives and be able to uh, to understand and to interpret and to help others as well, Lord Jesus. We praise you in Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. God bless. Have a good break and you can continue next class. See you again next week. God bless. Bye.